Sunday. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah, Tammy was saying that, well, next we thought next Sunday was uh, Jesus' birthday class, but they're changing it or not having it, so, I don't know. The following Sunday it'll be. Yeah, you guys want to be, you guys want to come, I'm going to be here, so I might as well have a class. Yeah. I'll be here. And I'll do arch code documents unless somebody... That would be interesting. Now, we, a few people have heard of them, they're really cool documents, you know, we can... That's the part of the class where I just figure out whether they're bibliographically correct. And that's what we'll talk about today. Yay! Um, this is really appropriate for Hebrews because, you know, I keep telling you Martin Luther didn't like Hebrews, but I, I've got the text of what he said about Hebrews and other documents that he didn't like, and we'll talk about those. But, you know, within the, I, I, I left these out. I, you know, I, I, I'm, it's not that I'm lazy. It's just these seem to be appropriate words for the the end of any Greek thing, and I'm going to talk more about those too, generally, but Logos and Telos, uh, if you don't know what they mean by now, I've been a terrible teacher, but I keep foot stomping them, so if, you know, in the military, if you foot stomp, that means it's going to be on the test. This, this would be on the test, right? And especially, uh, if I were to teach a test, I, I would personally make people draw this sign uh, logos to tell us, and we'll talk about it too in this class. About because we're going to do, uh, I guess, Veracity 201, Advanced Veracity. Uh, it's it's more to do with, um, okay. So the presumption from our Sunday school, right? From all the stuff we got in Sunday school, my presumption as a kid was. Well, of course, the New Testament, you know, the way we get it, God handed it to Brett, right? He gave it to the church. He handed it to the church. Here is the New Testament. Here you go, right? Just like the Old Testament. Wait, that's not how it happened, right? So how do we get it? A lot of people say, uh, oh, there was the council of, uh, yeah, the council. There was no council that is ever set the books of the New Testament. None at all. That's a myth. That's a mythos. Um, I'm not sure where that got started. I don't know where it comes from, but I. It, but it's it's interesting. There there is that idea. It may be because they confound that with the Council of Jamnia, which really did set the canon of the Old Testament, and the reformers. You know, what did the reformers pick, right? The reformers. But we'll talk about that because this is all important stuff. So, you know, the, the real thing is, the most important thing to us is how do we get the canon? How do we get the New Testament? We say canon. I'll, I'll just find the canon in a bit when we get to that point. But we got to get to there. So first of all, you know, we talked before about the, the legal historical tests. And don't... And, don't get confused. There's there's this thing that they call what they call the the something historical method of of looking at scripture historical critical historical critical something like that, which is is a I personally think it's the most silliest thing I ever heard of. That's not that's has nothing to do with legal historical. Legal historical has everything to do with going back and historically founding the sources of our documents, verifying that they are historically true. Okay, that's the point. So we use the legal historical method, which is one of the three ways to know truth, right? We have the scientific method, we have the logic, and we have the legal historical method. These are the methods to know truth. These are the way, methods to know what is history. And if, and if you ever, you know, I know we read history books, right? And we see the Discovery Channel. I don't personally watch TV, but I know about it. Okay, how much history is in any of that? How much history is in a history book? Better yet, do any historians ever read history books? No, they just uh, write them, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, they write, write them and make money off of them, but there's no history in them history books because history is always primary and secondary sources, right? A history book is a tertiary source. Now, you can quote from the primary and secondary sources, and we see that, right? But what are you doing when you're doing that? It's like a technical paper, right? 
if, for example, if you want to study about what slaves thought during the Civil War, what should you read? The journal or diary of a slave, probably. Yeah, exactly, to find out what they really thought. Because what a historian tells you they thought, right? They take something out of context and says, well, yeah, uh, you know, they, they felt this way. Well, just read it. You don't have to ha have what somebody else said about it. That's what's so cool about the New Testament documents, by the way. And we'll talk about the New Testament documents in the context of their, of their source, the primary, secondary, tertiary source, because that's the most important thing. So if you remember, back when we started talking about veracity, in veracity, we applied three tests to, to the, to specifically to Hebrews, but to the New Testament documents. And here's the, te you know, I, I repeated, I'm sorry, I, I repeated the information because I thought it was very pertinent. The pertinent information to this is, you know, the bibliographical. How many t texts do I have? I have over 779 Greek manuscripts of Hebrews. We'll talk about why it makes it a primary source document, why it is a primary source document. We know it's written 64 to 95 AD, most likely after 70 AD. It has 40 Old Testament quotes and, and Old Testament allusions, has 38 apocryphal allusions. Mysterion is mentioned zero times. The Ecclesia is mentioned one time. It's written to the Hebrews who spoke Greek and performed the Torah sacrifices, quoted by the Apostolic Fathers, and I got it down there. Uh, the first author to cite the epistle was Clement. That's circa 96 uh, CE. That's uh, I hate writing that CE thing. It's AD. AD, right? I'm gonna. I, I should fix that. Um, well, I copied it from a text. Uh, you know, and, and all these people are going uh, leftist crazy, right? It, it's it's uh, they didn't get CE Common Era. Well, what's the Common Era? Since the birth of Jesus Christ, oh my goodness gracious, we got to hide it because we don't want to trigger them youth, right? Um, he, Clement didn't say or wrote it, submitted from both the uh, uh, Marcionite canon, we'll talk about it, and the Maturian canon, we'll talk about both those. From the earliest times in church history, it's been a great dispute to its authorship, which is what we talked about, right? A number of different authors proposed through Paul, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Pauline authorship explicitly denied by origin. The successor, Clement, uh, who uttered the now famous agnostic confession. Whoever wrote the epistle, God only knows for sure. Okay. Other names are suggested. Tertullian first suggests Barnabas. Luther suggested Apollos. Um, I suggested it was Barnabas and Apollos because it uses we over and over again in the text. Um, so anyway, the you find it with a lot of the Paulian documents with a lot of polyam corpus, but that's uh, that really can't be considered weighty as it says in the little quote here. Anyway, so with with the bibliographical, with the veracity, we prove the veracity of Hebrews, right? So we we use a legal historical test to conclude that the written words of basically all the New Testament documents are historical fact, but specifically Hebrews. So there's no reason to doubt their historical accuracy or veracity or authority. So, the question we should have is, how do we get them? And why do we have the ones we have? They don't talk about the ones we don't have. We ha There's still others. And um, I actually have a class that I've taught where I go through all the others. Did you know there are 44 known Gospels? 44 known Gospels. Of the 44, there are only, I think, 14 or 12 extant. Extant means we have them. How do we know there are 44? The Apostolic Fathers quoted, mentioned them, or we know them in history, but they don't exist anymore. That should blow you away. We have 44 of these puppies that people said they read and they quoted them even. But we only have 12 or 14, I think it's 12. I think it's 12 total. I've got it in my text, but I, I didn't write it down here. Anyway, that's pretty interesting. Did you know that there's not only just, okay, we have the 27 books of the New Testament. We'll talk about it, but you know, in the original listings, there were more. Teen Hodos, when it started, what did Teen Hodos have in their pocket? Well, so to speak. 
Because it went in their pocket, right? What did they have? They had scrolls. Well, they had scrolls. They had the scrolls. They had the Torah scrolls. And you're not carrying them around with you, are you? Anybody ever seen a Torah scroll? Yeah. You know, they're huge. And by the way, they're expensive. $40,000. twenty dollars to $40,000 today. Which means that that's about the price in that time. A 40-acre farm, twenty dollars to $40,000. Just say it. You know. So, in the beginning, they had no New Testament docs, documents at all. They had the Old Testament, which is the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms, and the Apocrypha. Right? Matter of fact, the Apocrypha has always been considered part of the Old Testament, especially until 100 AD, the Council of Jamnia. And we'll, uh, let's see if I can remember that. But what happened is, all right, these guys are Greek speakers. They're Greek speakers, and they had something really important. They had LXX. They had the Septuagint. About 200 B.C., the, the, in Alexandria, they made a Greek translation of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five, which is what we're going to study next, that was written in Alexandria by the Greek-speaking Jews there. The original was a really good Greek translation of the Torah. Does anybody see a problem here? We had a translation class last week. So which kind of translation was it? Was it between the Greek and the Hebrew from Hebrew to Greek? Is that where you're well, their main problems? Well, when we talked about translations, uh, I think I got the notes down there. Let's see. I got there's a list of the translations. Yeah. So I talked about it. I had uh, you know you have these you had the interlinear type translations, you have literal translations, dynamic equivalent translations, historical grammatical translations, and you have paraphrases. And we acknowledge that's five different types of translation, but in between that, I told you there's like ten total. There's there's in betweens of all those. So what did they write? Was it a dynamic equivalent? Was it trying to maintain you know uh, historical um, uh, historical distance? What was it doing? Right? <laughs> I'm just telling you. You know, just to take the example, the example, right? So, in the beginning, gods, Elohim, with a, with a singular verb, gods. In the beginning, gods. And the spirit of gods was on the waters. And God amar, God spoke the command word. This, that's, and I've given you, you know, the Hebrew with the uh, English, in English, with a couple of the, of the words, the Hebrew words. In the Greek, Septuagint, it says, in the beginning, theos, singular verb, singular word, with a singular verb. In the beginning, theos. And the ruach, and the ruach of God, of theos, rested on the waters. And God, logos. God said the argument that created the world. Okay, we know that from that, John called the Logos Christ, right? Attributed the Christ to the Logos, which, by the way, the Amar, the command word, has always been considered, whatever, the, the creation, the word of creation that God created the universe with, the command. And we know that the Ruach, which is the, Hagios, um, the Hagios Penuma, the, the Ruach in Hebrew, which is the Hagios Penuma, the Penuma, right? So already th there are cultural associations on this because the Penuma in Greek, remember our thing here? Okay, Sarx, and I probably need to get another pin over there. Sarx, uh, Tsuke, and Penuma, <clears throat> right? Sarx, Tsuke, and Penuma. The Greeks believe that Panuma is represents what? Well, free will, right? 
This, these are both breath. Suke and Panuma are both breath, but Suke is the unconscious breath. The Greeks believe that you always were thinking. You couldn't stop thinking. The conscious breath, okay, so I'm breathing and I'm thinking at the same time, right? And all of a sudden, I take a deep breath. <gasps> Why did I take a deep breath? Because you wanted to. Because I willed it. I have the free will to do it. But the Greeks saw that as an am amazing. They did not believe animals. Animals don't have, animals can't think. And if you think animals can think, you're on the wrong side. I eat animals, okay? Animals can't think. They just, if you know anything about behavioral studies on animals, animals do what they do. They appear to think, but they're not. They're like computer programs that are keep running. And the scientists keep telling us that computer programs are going to be as smart as you are. I don't think so. We'll, we'll wait and see. But I, I have a great doubts about whether they can get conscious thought, a spirit, from a computer. But we'll see, right? They think they can. They'll probably pronounce it while it's destroying us, right? Like the Terminator. But anyway, so the Greeks believe that animals can't exert free will. We believe that too. Or we, we think that scientifically. Animals, why do they breathe deeper sometimes? Because they ran. It's like you. You run, you got a pant. <laughs> but your dog doesn't go, well, I'm going to take a deeper breath. <gasps> like I just did, right? Your dog can't do that because they don't have free will. So Panuma is the conscious breath. The conscious breath in Greek is the Panuma. It isn't spirit. And by the way, the view of the Hebrews is completely different. As a matter of fact, the Hebrews have no concept of free will. It's, it's just not in their vocabulary. Because remember, man in, the, man in the Old Testament was made with Adam, with dirt, dirt, red dirt to be specific, and nefesh. Nefesh is the breath. What breath? I don't know. Animals have nefesh. God has ruach. And man does not have ruach. The only time man had ruach, you know when man, when, okay, I'm getting really deep in this. I'm running down a rabbit hole, but this is really critical kind of thought. The reason that man had ruach, when did God give man ruach? Do you know? What's that? No, no, no. Even before that. The prophets. No, we don't see it anywhere until the beginning of the prophets. And I think Saul is the first one it talks about. It talks about the Ruach being given by, men, by God to men to prophesize, right? And what did they do? How did you know they were prophets? They got naked. It says in the Old Testament. Come on, you guys, Old Testament. Well, you got, you got purgated Old Testament. So you need to look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew says they got naked. They took off all their clothes and they prophesied. That's how they knew Saul had been touched by the Ruach of God was because he took off all his clothes. And by the way, remember David got in trouble because he was dancing naked in front of the ark of God because the ruach of God had come upon him. So anyway, this, these, are really, these are really important, deep things, but we can't dwell too much on them. But the big deal is that in the Old Testament, when it was translated into the Greek from the Hebrew, Hebrew is a highly euphemistic language. Highly euphemistic. Greek is not. So when Greek uses suke, they mean thought or thinking. They mean the unconscious breath. When Greek uses pneuma, they mean the conscious breath. The Greeks would have said that the Old Testament infers that God has free will. Right? And through his free will, he spoke the logical argument. Which puts... Man, how is, in a Greek worldview, how is man like God? They can think logically. And? Free will. And he has free will. <clears throat> this is huge. This is, this is all, that is all of Christian theology in a bucket, in a tiny bucket. That is all of Christian theology, the beginning of Christian theology. That is the image of God. Anyway, I'm going to... 
These are, these are important concepts. You've got to have it. So anyway, they, they have the Septuagint. And so this means, and by the way, every quote in the New Testament, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in on New Testament, every quote in the New Testament is from the Septuagint. Every single one of them. They took it verbatim, which means that the writers of the New Testament documents knew what? Well, not just Greek. They knew the Septuagint. They didn't. They're not. They're not translating now. Now, including Christ. Okay, let's talk about Christ a little bit. I think it's my next thing. Okay, what about Christ? Um, Christ. We know that Christ. How do we know that Christ could read Hebrew? He read in the synagogue. He read the scrolls in the synagogue. You got to know, Hebrew was a dead language. Dead language at the time. Just like Latin is a dead language. Doesn't mean that people can't read it or speak it. It means that it was only, it was not, I wouldn't be in the marketplace saying in Hebrew to you, right? The marketplace, they spoke two languages, Aramaic and Greek. It is obvious that Jesus Christ was a Greek dude. Was a, he was Hebrew, but he obviously spoke Greek. Why? Because every time he speaks Hebrew or Aramaic, they quote him in the New Testament documents. Right? So Jesus had to be a Greek speaker, and when he talked to the people, he was in Greek which all the people obviously understood Greek. Or he wouldn't have used it. And the New Testament wouldn't have been written in it. So we got to understand this is really important. So Jesus understood the Hebraic documents. Hebraic documents. He also understood Aramaic. And he obviously probably read and, read and wrote, read and write. He didn't write. We don't know of anything he wrote. But we do know he wrote in the, well, that was... That's another problem. Okay, that's that's uh, we'll talk about that. But Jesus likely was fully literate because he could read Hebrew, which means he went to the synagogue school. We also know that he probably knew the Mishnah and the Talmud really well. How do you know that? Because he was Jewish over the age of thirteen. Well, um, if you're Jewish, up to, if you went through the Bar Mitzvah, okay, you memorized the first five books of the Torah. You, you memorize the first, you memorize the Torah. It was only if you got extra training that you learned the other books and the Mishnah. We discussed it with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's exactly correct. So when he was in the temple, when he was, what, how old was he? Twelve? Twelve in the temple? Okay. And they said that he amazed them. The only way that a twelve-year-old is going to amaze Sadducees is what? Well, he knows the other. He knows the Tanakh. You have the Torah and the Tanakh. Tanakh. The Torah is the first five. The Tanakh is the other scrolls. If Jesus knew the other scrolls, he would impress the Pharisees or the Sadducees. How did he impress the Pharisees? You got to know the mission, and the, you got to know the mission and the arguments around the mission. So, and, and by the way, how do we know Jesus knew the Mishnah? Every time he pounded the Pharisees, he quotes from the Mishnah. He doesn't quote from the Old Testament. He doesn't quote from the Septuagint. He quotes from the Mishnah. Is it, is it legal for a man to take his, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a man's animal falls into a well, is it legal for him to pull the animal out of the well? On the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Okay, that is a direct Mishnah question. When they ask him, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? That is a Pharisee Mishnah question. These are all Mishnah questions. The point was, when he quoted them, he went back. He quoted not only the Mishnah documents, but he also quoted the Torah documents, which really irritated him. Yes, sir? Just an interesting thought. Since Jesus is God and God is all-knowing, did he ever have to study anything? <laughs> um, boy, that's a great question. According to the Arch Code documents... Jesus had a rabbi that taught him, and the rabbi was really impressed because he was recommending him up to, you know, to the next level, right? To go to Jerusalem and study under 
like Gamaliel or some other rabbi. So uh, Christ is God, Christ is man. I don't, I don't know. You know, I tried to define it for you, right? That, that the three-dimensional, the three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional God is Christ, right? Christ, Holy Spirit, and God. So what, you know, how much knowledge is, does that being have? Well, it was limited. I mean, there were things that he said, I don't know. Like, I don't know when that will happen. Only the Father knows. So he was limited in his knowledge in his human form. Well, he said that. But what does that really mean? There's a lot more to look at. You know, when we look at the language, and you're right on. I don't disagree. In our translation, it says that. But then you ask the question, well, how can Christ be separated from God when he's a three-dimensional projection of God? Right? And I think it has to do with Sark, Suke, and Penuma. You know, it has to do with the division, not of God, but the division of, of, of the being, right? So I don't know. I, the, okay, I can answer almost every other question in theology. And guess what? There are whole theological tomes written on this. Aquinas wrote about this. Augustine wrote about this. People wrote about this stuff. This is deep stuff. This is kind of stuff that in Christianity, we ought to be steeped in it, right? But, but people have been not arguing. They've been thinking and writing and concluding about this for 2,000 years, right? The corpus of information. And then you get some doofus, doofus you know, from some church that says, oh, you know, this is a new idea. There's no new ideas. People have been thinking about this stuff for 2,000 years. Really smart people. Right? You know, we think we're smart, but how many of you guys can, like, pick up a Greek book and just thumb through it, right? Or how many can pick up a Latin text or a Hebrew text? Our forefathers and mothers knew this stuff cold and spoke five languages, right? Like Ivanka Trump. They were actually educated in language and in other subjects. And what are we? We're like, you know, thinking we're the peak of humanity, and our educational system doesn't give us the breaks that they had 100 years ago. Just say it. You know, the fact that I teach, you know, the three methods to know truth, these are, these are known things for 2,000 years. But most people have never even heard of it except the scientific method. And, and you know, when you heard, I'm, I'm going down the rabbit hole again. When you hear the scientific method, does it make you all automatically think, well, isn't there other methods? Right? I mean, if you, if you have to have a, a name for a method, that... Doesn't that presume there are other methods? Otherwise, it'd just be called the method. Yeah, you, you just call it the method, right? Yeah. So the way. It, it's astounding to me that we in our school systems teach kids the scientific method so you can be like Greta Thunberg and hardly you know, mentally competent, but then at the same time, we don't teach them the methods to know the veracity of historical documents and logic to know how to put it all together. It's astounding. Anyway. So I would argue that all of our all of those those disciples may have been better educated than we are because they at least knew three languages, you know, because Peter and those boys had gone through the synagogue school, right? So they knew how to read at least the Torah. They had memorized the Torah, Mem memorized, not just read. They memorized the Torah. How many of you guys have memorized the Torah? I haven't. Oh, so, right. Anyway, so. The first, so this, this sect, the way, the sect in the way, they had documents, right? People wrote just like Hebrews, and we have all the documents in the New Testament. We noted, and, and I'm going back, but we have, the, we have the historical legal method. So they wrote these documents, and we'll talk about the source in a minute. But somebody put together the canon, and the first complete canon of the New Testament was in A.D. 6, uh, 367, Anastasius. Anastasius published a list of books to be read in churches under his care. If you remember, Paul says not just to read scripture, although our books translated that way, it says read everything. Paul says to Timothy to read everything that's written. The presumption of Paul was there is nothing written that is bad. Today we'd say, yeah, there's some bad stuff. But 
In the ancient world, if you're going to write down something, you're putting a huge investment in. So your average pornographer is not writing his... Matter of fact, short stories and novels could not get off the ground until the printing press and until books became cheap. We've talked about this, right? You can't do things unless you have a market to support them. This is why capitalism is so great. If we had socialism, we still wouldn't have novels. You know, John, uh, Dickens would be what? Writing... Uh, I guess uh, Pravda or something. I don't know. I'm just saying, when, when you have the availability of technology, it enables you to have new sources of entertainment, ability to create things, for example, books and translations. But in the early period, all they had were manuscripts and scrolls. The first codexes were written of the New Testament documents. A codex is a book. The reason they made codexes is because... If I try to carry around a scroll, it's this big, right? But if I have a codex of that same scroll, it's like, well, I might have my, my servant carries it in his backpack. He's got his Hello Kitty backpack, and the servant's carrying it around, right? So at least you can pull it out and read it as opposed to the scroll, which is huge. So anyway, the first New Testament canon and his stages put together, he, he, have, he has precisely those books we have in our modern Bibles, Except, what did he include? He had all the Apocrypha, including Baruch. He omitted Esther. Whoa, that's interesting, isn't it? Huh? There are other lists that were published by others as early as the year 170. But they didn't all agree. So, the first ever, the first ever was Marcion. Now, Marcion is the issue. Anybody know why Marcion is an issue? Okay. This stuff gets really difficult because, okay, I think that the average teen hodos person, like speaking Greek, many of them reading Greek, what does that presume? What does that presume if they can, if they're reading Greek? Yeah, yeah, but remember we talked about this, right? The it, the problem you got. What did you? Okay, Teen Hodos appealed. We talked about this. this is all of Hebrews. All of Hebrews. What did Teen Hodos appeal to? All the different groups. Yeah, all the groups. And you know, when I list the groups, I start. You know, I say the Romans. You know, we have the Romans and the Greeks, and we have the um, we have the Hebrews, and then we have the four the the Egyptians. These are just groups, right? What other groups are we having in those groups? We got we got the royalty. And slave and free. Yeah, yeah. We got the free men and women. And then we got the slaves. And we know <laughs> Paul said what? You're all equal. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, he said you're an ecclesia. You're an ecclesia of free slave and, and Obviously, what's happening here? Remember, the Council of Nicaea, or the Council of Jerusalem told them, the Council of Jerusalem said, where do you go to learn? The synagogues, right? What do they do in the synagogues? What's the only thing they do in the synagogues, really? They read the Torah, and they study the Torah, and they teach others, because that's where you go to see the rabbi, right? There ain't no rabbis in the, in the temple. The rabbis are in the synagogues. And so, what are they doing there? They're learning. They're reading. They're learning to read. Talk about an amazing thing. Okay, I don't think most people think about this much, but early Teen Hodos, Teen Hodos said, you're all equal. So can these guys learn to read? Yes. And how about these guys? Mm -hmm. And these guys? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the royals probably knew less than the slaves. Right? You know why? They need to. They need to. Everyone else doing it. Yeah, if, if you want somebody to read your scroll, what do you do? Scroll slave reading. Scroll slave Right? You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to memorize yourself. Why would you do that? So, it's not, we know that's true. The Royal X, right? The Royal X? Some of those guys couldn't even write their names. I think George III couldn't even write, read, write in English. Couldn't speak English. Anyway, 
So the first New Testament canon was by Marcion. The problem with Marcion is Marcion was a Gnostic. And Christianity created, remember I told you, this, you know, this stuff is really deep because it all fits together. In religion, you start with animism. Yeah, I changed this other one. How about we try, well, green will probably be not dark. Animism. Ooh, that's good. Animism, can you read that? Yep. Animism, you go to pantheonic paganism, you go to uh, mysterion, and you go to Gnosticism. Gnosticism was caused by Christianity. Because Gnosticism is a belief in truth, and Marcion was a Gnostic. Matter of fact, there was no Gnostics until Christianity. This is really interesting, isn't it? Um, uh, Marx is a Gnostic. Well, except he doesn't believe in any gods, but really he's a Gnostic. The, most scientists are Gnostics. A lot of, well, not most. Non-Christian scientists are Gnostics. They believe that, that, that knowledge is going to free them and make them and give them salvation. So anyway, Gnosticism... Is, is an outgrowth of Christianity, but it's a belief in knowledge. I'm not going to go into detail. You can, you can think, about, think about why this would be. But anyway, what happened was Marcion was a Gnostic. And Gnostic seeking knowledge means they want to read the documents, right? They want them. Marcion thought it was important to give them only certain ones. He gave them Luke. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Philemon. Why do you think he left off Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and uh, all the others? Because they weren't first person? Yeah, like nope. They didn't fit his theology. So therefore, he wanted to exclude from the groups. The problem is... Well, for example, Luke is Luke is a, well, we'll talk about source and we have time, but Luke is supposed to be a secondary source. I argue it is not a secondary source, but that's okay. But he didn't like the others. Now, some, some people like Brown argues, well, this meant because it wasn't in Marcion's list, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. That's totally bogus. That's false. Because Irenaeus, Irenaeus right afterwards, came out with his list. His list was to confute Marcion. Marcion had his specific list because he was trying to theologically dominate with Gnosticism, right? And the Gnostics are big into knowledge, so they're reading everything. If I can keep you from reading, if I can keep you from reading the Mueller report, you won't know what was in it, right? So I don't want you to read it because you might have knowledge. I don't want you to read the Bible or the Bible biblical documents if I'm in uh, government-controlled schools, because I don't want you to know what's in them, right? This is what Marx did. So the best thing is, Arrhenius came out with his list, and Arrhenius's list includes all the normal documents, 27 documents of the New Testament. It also included a few others. Um, we'll talk about those. I don't know if I have the list. I think I have another thing. But anyway... Um, the earliest manuscripts after that was Origen. Origen included all the ones that Arrhenius did and uh, Athanasius. So, from about uh, 170 AD, we had a list of all the early, we had all the 27 documents. Plus there are a few others, and I don't think I have them in my list. Darn it. Because there's like the... Uh, Shepherd of Hermes and a few others that are New Testament documents. In, in my other class, in the classes I teach about this, we go over all those documents. So that's the fun thing about it. So in this, I don't have them totally listed. The earliest complete manuscripts, and I probably should have given you this, but the Chester Beatty papyri, uh, papyrus is from 200 AD. It has almost all the New Testament on papyrus. papyrus. The Codus uh, Vaticanus, which is from 325 to 350 A.D., has a, is a codex with it's a, it's it has a codex, so it's a book with all the stuff in it, and that was uh, declared by uh, Constantine had to make those. Uh, there's a lot that goes, but there we have complete manuscripts of the New Testament documents going to about 200 A.D., which means in Marcion's time. All those documents existed. And plus, we've gone and looked at the veracity of the text anyway. Um, in any case, 
What Marcion did for us, though, is she provided an impetus to do what? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you could have any, well, the difficulty of writing books makes it really difficult to put out pseudo stuff, because of cost, right? Who's going to who's gonna pitch 10,000 bucks to put something out that's fake? I mean, that's like, dude, that's, that's Looney Tunes, right? That's really crazy stuff. So, how do you think they proved, why do you think they chose to pick these books, first of all? The legal, these guys were steeped in Greek philosophy and thought. So the Greeks were into legal historical, scientific method, and reason, logic, right? So they used the legal historical method first. They said, you know, first of all, they said, what's the pri what is the, the source? Is it primary, secondary, tertiary? Who gave it to us, right? Remember, we've been through this before. How did you get these documents? A slave, or the person who actually wrote it. I mean, Paul may have delivered some of his own texts, but in general, a book slave brought it to you, and he goes, eh, you're, and, and by the way, on, on scrolls, we know from history when we found scrolls, the address is always on the back, the reverse. I, I mentioned this in this class. Why do we not know who wrote Hebrews? Because when they copy it, it's so expensive. Do you copy the obverse? No, it's too expensive. So you only copy the proverse, the front of the document, the front side of a scroll. So in a codex, it gets easier, but by that time, you lost it, right? So they copy not the, uh, the obverse, the back part, which has the address on the scroll. When you roll up a scroll, when you're a kid, right, roll up a scroll, there's an address on it. But when you open the scroll, there's a text. So all the scrolls we found in antiquity that were originals, and we don't have any, but the ones that were copied that we know are full copies, they have the address on the back. So anyway, the proof is, I bring it to you and go, hey, this is from Paul. And you say, read it, right? That's the way it works. So anyway, Arrhenius used these, these quotes, you know, or these, this legal historical point, plus the ratifications of the decisions of the early church. Um, ratification of decisions. I told you, there's 44 known gospels, but we only have 12. Which means what? The others weren't worth... Well, the, the, the worth, they weren't worth... Exp it wasn't worth putting 20,000 bucks into something that you knew wasn't worth, like, for example, the famous two... Gospel of Thomas. Why not the Gospel of Thomas? By the way, the Gospel of Thomas is, is one of those 12, and it's contemporaneous with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But why not the Gospel of Thomas? It's not worth, it wasn't worth recording, even if it includes the quotes of Christ. Because number one, I've, I've talked about this before. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as C.S. Lewis says, are unique. Because they are ancient documents that include both narrative and dialogue. In ancient works, you don't find those two together until the Gospels. The Gospels are the first. The Gospel of Thomas is only dialogue. It includes no narration. It is considered a Gnostic text. So is the Gospel of Judas. Plus, Judas was croaked. How is he going to write a gospel when he's a dead man, right? So just saying, we see these pseudo-gospels, right? And the pseudo-gospels, the reason they weren't the reason they weren't continued on is because even if they had some viability, they weren't worth anything to the early scholars, the early church, right? It, they, they weren't even worth anything to the Gnostics, right? Because the Gnostics were interested in reading whatever they could get their hands on. But if even the Gnostics didn't keep copying them, right? It means they were totally worthless. Anyway, so with Arrhenius, and you got the ancient canon list. I've got a list here. I didn't give it to you, but you know, you got the Maturian, uh, you've got all these down to John of Damascus, whatever. Finally, you say, well, they, they finalized the canon. How do they finalize the canon? Well, first of all, what's the canon? 
Canon is basically considered the authoritative witness. It's, uh, canon in Greek means it's a ruler. It's a ruler. So it's like, you know, the... All right. We can't, we can't build stuff with the royal Cupid. Why? Cupid. Because everybody's royal Cupid is different. I've got to have a canon. I've got to have a... a, 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 a no matter whose it is, it better be the same. Because if I'm building one side of the, t of the pyramid and you're building the other side, we ain't going to meet. It ain't going to happen. You're toast. So you got to have a canon, a rod that's the right length. So the canon itself, the canon of Scripture, was finalized about 170. But, well, and we can say they independently approved the same books. We see that in the list. Um, there were a lot of scholars, early scholars, you know, uh, basically bishops. But the thing is that there was never a, you know, we, we like to think like there was, you know, a Nicene, uh, Council of Nicaea or so-and-so. Like Council of Nicaea did affirm, approve the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, right? I think they also approved the Anastasian Creed. But they approved the creeds on their agenda was not the scripture. Why? It depends on how you look at the world, okay? The churches, the churches believed, or the teen hodos in general, early church believed that they were holding in their hands what kind of documents? Did they believe they had theological documents? They believed they had historical documents, which I agree. I'm not, it's not a function of belief, it's a fact. They were holding their hands historical documents. So if you hold the historical documents, do I need to say that, for example, they're inspired? They're historical, right? It, it, like, for example, if I have a, a copy of, of Wash, George Washington's, you know, um, history, autobiography, would I ever say it's inspired? No, it's history. I've got a piece of history in my hand, right? I don't need to call it inspired. The Old Testament has other problems, problems that we will address in the Torah class because we'll talk about veracity of the Old Testament. But there are issues, and the, and the people in that period knew those issues. That's why they declared, and the Council of Jamni affirmed, the inspiration of the Old Testament. But if I have a piece of history, if I have a letter from Paul, I don't have to tell you that it's inspired by God. All I have to tell you is what? It's a letter from, it's a letter from Paul, right? If I, have a, if I have the Gospels, all I have to tell you, hey, Mark, who was a disciple of Peter, wrote this. I have this. This is his observation, his word, right? And Luke. Luke is probably the most little uh, uh, historical um, guy that we have. I don't have to tell you that Luke, do I have to tell you? Luke wrote a history. Right? No. Luke wrote a biography of what he saw. In an autobiography, he had information from people. We, we believe from looking at the document, they weren't as refined as we are, right? We're really refined. At the bottom of all our things, we put bibliographies and people I talked to and all this information and videotapes. They didn't have them. They didn't have recordings or videotapes. The best they could do is make quotes. And they didn't have quotes, remember? No quote signs, no paragraphs, no... All they had was the ability to record this information. And so we, that's why we believe Luke taught to Mary. We did that in the class. We talked about it. Why in the Acts he talks to certain people. So anyway, the authoritative witness, and by the way, the church, the, the Catholic church, still holds the opinion that the documents are historical in nature. So... And I think this is, a, this is a very healthy view. They believe that if all of a sudden you got a new letter that came up, let's say we found a new Paulian letter or a new letter from Mark or a new letter from somebody, what would they do? They'd include it, right? If it's authoritative and, and you can prove the veracity, right? The problem is, what is hard to do now? Yeah, we're so 
far removed right. from it in time. So it's, yeah, to authenticate it would be about impossible. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. But if you could, they would include it. Now, what would we do? We dither for a while and dither for a while, and we, you know, kind of have this. But we, we call because of Martin Luther. Sorry about this. He, they declared the the um, part of the Reformation era. They used the um, legal historical method to accept the veracity of the text, but then they did something else. Didn't they declare closed? They declared well. They they declared it inspired. By declaring it inspired, you basically declared it closed. You said this is it. This is all. The problem was that old Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther. Let's see, I'm going to go jump up to Martin Luther. Martin Luther said that based on history and the list from history that he didn't like Hebrews, James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2nd and 3rd John, and the Revelation of John. So what he did is he put it in the very back. He did just like the Apocrypha. He took, you know, in the Apocryphal works, he... We believe, he didn't write it down, but we believe that he took, there was a council of Jamnia. We don't know when it was, but I guarantee you there was a council of Jamnia by the Hebrews. The Hebrews were really concerned that those Greek, teen hodos, Christian, that were also Greek, were basically taking the documents and trying to foist Greek documents on the Hebrew people. So they declared that if the document did not originate as a Hebrew document, it was not part of the, of the Tanakh and Torah, and it couldn't be used for readings. You couldn't read anything except the Torah scrolls in Hebrew. So that totally messed up everything, even into the Masoretic period. Because in a synagogue, you can't read with the pointless. You have to read the original text in Hebrew. And so if it's not originally in Hebrew, but they made a couple of mistakes, but that was their problem. Martin Luther said, I don't agree, I agree with the Council of Jamnia. So he took those books that were they thought were originally Greek, and they put them in the back. And he called them the Apocrypha. Guess what? He did the same thing with the New Testament. He took, um, he took Hebrews, he took Hebrews, James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation of John, and he threw them. He called them ante legomina, and he put them in the back. So in the back of his Bible, just like he did the Apocrypha. So, um, and by the way, until 1826, everybody had all those works in their Bible, but we didn't take, in 1826, we, we reintegrated. <laughs> well, the Lutherans finally reintegrated, but we reintegrated all those books into our Bible. So we basically thumped our nose at Luther, Martin Luther. But... Again, the reformers all criticized Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. So in the, uh, the 1522 New Testament, Luther placed the books, like I said, at the end. He wrote about Hebrews. Up to this point, we have had to do with the true and certain chief books of the New Testament. The four which follow have from ancient times had a different reputation. So he called them, let's see what he said about it specifically. Because we're running out of time. Um, this is what he said. In the first place, it's flatly against St. Paul and all the rest of Scripture describing justification of works. Said that Abraham was justified by his works when he offered his son Isaac. Through Romans 4, St. Paul teaches the contrary, and Abraham was justified apart from works by his faith alone. Before he'd offer his son and proves it by Moses, Genesis 15, etc., etc., etc. So he goes on and on. If you read the... If you read Martin Luther's opinion of Hebrews, well, you, you can figure it out. What do you think about the pistis chapter? We call it the faith chapter, but there's no such word in Greek. But what did he think about it? He hated it. Most of you guys love that, right? I mean, I love it because when you put pistis in, it's like, wow, that's really Greek. But if you even read it in the English translation where it says faith, most people's faith is well, that's bad, because if you don't have enough faith, are you saved? Oh, sorry, I'm convinced. I don't need, I'm, I'm uh, what, uh, I'm an and gate, right? I'm not a, I'm not an or gate, I'm an and gate, so either or, or I'm an or gate, I'm not an and gate, I'm, I'm either or, right? I've got it all, because I, I believe, I, I have, I'm convinced, right? 
But Paul, or I mean, um, Martin Luther said, well, that's not good. That's works. So he did not like that at all. That's one of the reasons he didn't like Hebrews. Um, anyway, uh, we, you could go on and on. I think these are really interesting works to look at because, you know, if you look at it within the context of their writing, then you say, well, well, ultimately, why did, why did Martin Luther not like them, but the early church loved them? And the church today loves them. Martin Luther didn't like them because he's like Marcion. He didn't want your theology encroached by other ideas. So he wanted to limit your thinking, right? But it's okay, he left them in, which is a positive the reason the early church left them in is because it was the Catholic view. Their history. Don't take away the history, right? Don't, don't stop letting me read uh, Huckleberry Finn because you don't like what's in it. Right? You see what I'm saying? So read your Huckleberry Finn, read your Hebrews, and find out what the New Testament history is about. And that's historical documents. That's why... It'd be really fun, you know, I'll do the uh, Archco class and we'll look at documents that are in deep dispute. But yet, they are really cool documents, right? And we can only look over the titles and stuff, but you can find them. You might even find them on the internet because they're, they're freebies. But the Vatican, the Vatican has copies. They're, the guy who, who copied and translated the Archco documents said that he was able to borrow the copies kind of through a shifty means. They didn't, he got a hold of a priest, you know, a, a, an acolyte who didn't really know that he wasn't supposed to share them with him. So he was able to study them and copy them by hand because the Vatican wouldn't let you, this is back in the 1920s, 1910s. So he was able to make copies of them, and then he made translations. So we have English translations of Archco documents, which are really interesting documents. But in any case, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. No class today, Um Well, I could give a class next.